Kev, welcome to the Health Path podcast. It's nice to, to see your face after so many WhatsApp voice note exchanges. <laughs> Loads of them. Thanks for having me on, mate. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a, a long time coming. So how are things? Uh, things are really good, yeah. Busy, busy with work, busy with the breath work, busy with, with, with cold stuff still as well. Um, and yeah, this this kind of this work's going all over the place at the moment. Um, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying getting to meet thousands of people now. Uh, so, yeah, it's good, it's good fun. Yeah. And I think uh, I think it was Al from Excel who initially connected us. Um, I don't know how long ago now, but it's probably coming up to a couple of years. And we we've exchanged quite a few messages around the different forms of breath work and you know what you're experiencing with your clients being so busy both with breath work and getting into cold water um, sure. and that's kind of morphed into a few conversations around sort of psychedelics and this kind of renaissance that's happening um, but for listeners that might not yet be familiar with you and what you do are you happy just to to give us a little kind of intro and background sure yeah um, I, I'm a mechanic by trade and um, normally um, and I've done varying jobs but I, I sort of came into breath work uh, and cold exposure uh, and mental health, really, and therapy, working with people about two years ago when I founded um, Breathe Illusion. Um, and I start that, I run that on my own, um, and I'm sort of dealing with people every week, ranging, uh, we have things like anxiety, panic disorder, claustrophobia, respiratory conditions, asthma, COPD, um, very rare cases, things like emphysema, but I have worked with them. Um, and I'm working with, with all ages from, from children, six, seven years old, uh, up to 78 was, was my oldest um, client that I, I took into the cold. Wow. And, um, yeah, so ranging up from all over the place. So yeah, so I'm originally, I, was, I started off taking people into the cold, getting them to regulate their breathing whilst going into cold water to to maintain parasympathetic state whilst going into what would normally be a, um, a, a sympathetic drive of, of hyperventilating breath being taken away, you know, releasing a lot of adrenaline and you know, getting into cold water. Um, it started to help people. Um, so I, it's, the group just started to get bigger and bigger at the reservoir. And before I knew it, I was, I was, I was just doing it as a, as a day job. Uh, people were paying me to take them in. So, so two years later, here I am, still, still, still doing it into it, one way or another. <laughs> Amazing. And has your has your practice, or how has your, I guess, relationship and understanding awareness of the breath changed over that time? Because I kind of get the sense that from our conversations, it there may be subtle if not profound sort of changes in just with all this experience that you're getting sure yeah i think you're probably right the latter mate, the profound experience uh, changes really in my opinion of it i think the thing is is that and i've got to hold my hands up here that when when i first started to do this i was doing wim hof breathing i was doing tumo and um, hyperventilation techniques stressor exercises which didn't really work with everybody um, so from the outset, then I was trying to look after anxious people who couldn't do it. And then I started to realize the actual benefits of this hyperventilation technique and, and the benefits of this in the body and in the mind and what this was doing in terms of people's ability to adapt and create resilience in the body and mind. Um, and then, of course, then I learned with Patrick McKeown in Ireland. I did my Buteco uh, instructor's course with him. And one of his registered instructors, and um, it changed again. And I think we have even had a conversation where I said, "Oh yeah, holotropic breathing—it's this, it's that. It's not really safe, and shouldn't really be doing this, shouldn't really be doing that." And you know, a lot of that it's changed now because because of just how beneficial that's that, that's being, you know, with, with my clients, you know, and how. If you use it in the correct way and create safety and you create a safe space, um, then it's very different than these sort of massive big group accelerated sort of sessions that can sometimes frighten people. Um, but not everybody it was the first time I experienced 
heavy breath work was in a group setting and I loved it. It was great. Well, obviously, like I say, one size shoe doesn't fit all with breath. Uh, just the same as it doesn't with psychedelics and everything else, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. I think um, there are quite a lot of different techniques from a breath perspective. And I've spoken to a lot of people who, who find, oh, you've frozen. Yeah, so I think I can definitely agree with that, Kev. There are there are quite a few different techniques and names of breathwork out there. You know, you've got transformational, holotropic, Wim Hof, rebirthing, conscious connected breathing, etc. Um, and they don't all fit everyone for various reasons. You know, I've spoken with quite a few people who who just didn't really get on with the technique that is sort of coached in transformational breath, for example. So sometimes it's literally the the way people are instructed to breathe just doesn't really fit for whatever reason. Um, and then as you've mentioned, you've just got what sort of states we are in psycho-emotionally going into it. Some people will prefer doing a one-to-one -one session to kind of explore things like holotropic or transformational breath, whereas others might actually feel a lot safer and be more inclined to go into a, a group session straight away. Um, you know, I've only done holotropic once, but it was, I can see how for some people it could be really challenging, not only with what comes up for ourselves, but also what we, what we get to witness in others. Um, so depending on what kind of state we're going into that experience with, it's going to have a big impact on how we relate to that experience, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Every, everything what you said there is exactly yes, spot on. Really, in terms of what I, I witness most weeks with transformative breathing, um, and the the thing is with it. I mean, what I've realised um, is that if you take away the human aspect of it in terms of your breathing, and I'm constantly listening to podcasts and the human lab, and I'm, I'm constantly listening to scientists and pulmonauts from all over the world who are who are constantly in sort of respiratory thought. They're, they're constantly mm -hmm. aware of their breath all the time, um, which is really hard to do, especially when you're busy and you're, you're working. I find myself over breathing myself quite a lot sometimes and shallow breathing. I've been doing it all my life though. Mm -hmm. um, asthmatic and all that sort of thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, people's, um, in terms of the animal, you know, and, and how safe that animal feels in the environment, whether that's a supermarket or a pod or a tent doing some breath work uh, or, or out in the open, slight alterations in those environments can make a, can make a big difference to, to the result and to how, um, and to how clients, how, how, how uh, paying clients and how people who are paying to do this uh, get results. So you have to be quite careful with environment because most of the time the people that you end up working with as breath coaches the people that you're working with are in autonomic dysfunction and social kind of dysregulation um, and they perceive environments that are very safe to be quite unsafe because most of the time they're in that so by getting them to lie down and 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 breathe is very, very, very different to getting them to sit down and breathe, depending on their PTSD, their trauma, or their abuse. Um, a lot of people are abused, lay down. So if you lay down people and start breathing heavily with them through the mouth, they drop straight into it quite fast. Whereas, um, you know, some people, they don't. They experience trauma, sat down, car accidents, things like that. Um, we get quite a few of those. Um, so if you sit them up and try to do breathing exercises with them, it's the opposite. They get straight into it because the autonomic nervous system will quickly remember the breath that you, in terms of the body keeps the score. Yeah. Will quickly remember the breath that you witnessed when you were, you came round from your accident, your airbags in your face or whatever the situation is. And you, <laughs> your body remembers that because it doesn't ever want you to be there again. So it's a dangerous moment. So it will keep throwing that in at you all the time, which is what people, people are struggling to sleep and stuff. So you sit people up in that position, they're going to go straight back to that moment. That's really interesting. So you're actually using that position as a way to 
integrate and process the trauma through the breath is that yeah. what we're saying yeah yeah so typically i mean sometimes you have to be careful obviously because if people have been abused when they've been laid down um it can be too frightening for them, for them to carry carry on so you have to sort of gently move them into it sometimes starting them breathing sat down and then lay them down once they're into it once they've got used to some of them sensations the lightheadedness the pins and needles then lie them back keep breathing keep breathing keep going now now you're comfortable you're safe and get them to get them to, get them to carry on yeah and because holotropic sat up is quite difficult <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, that's really interesting, though, to kind of hear about the correlations between, you know, the, the type of trauma, the position that someone may be in experiencing the trauma, and then the position that we might actually put that person in to start the breath session. Um, because ultimately, I guess we're, we're using the breath to integrate to trauma, to metabolize that sort of stagnant energy, as I've sometimes heard it get described. Um, how have you found this from a sort of I was speaking to a colleague Victoria Fenton around trauma the other day and she was saying how sometimes people can get quite addicted to these kind of cathartic states whereby you know they're really crying screaming laughing whatever it may be but she was kind of explaining how if that is a sort of a repetitive fashion within these sorts of breath sessions for example that we're not actually we're not helping and we're not really integrating or metabolizing the trauma. We're just having a cathartic release that might feel good, but ultimately what we need to do is come back to that breath as quickly as we can. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, and you tend to find that people that come to do this, and I found that people that um, past, in the past have been drug addicts, alcoholics, addicts in general, uh, or people who have had eating disorders, um, that they tend to get kind of addicted to the breath then and, and, and find it as a, that they're using the cathartic breath as, as a safety net um, or to try and get to safety by being so sympathetic that they eventually they come back afterwards, they come back to parasympathetic and, and they're using that rather than eating or drinking alcohol or, or taking cocaine. So then it becomes, you're kind of abusing, I suppose. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't suppose I'm really in any position to say whether that's abusing or not, really, because I don't do the real do the science on it, and the, I don't think there really is a lot of science on this. Even, you know, um, Stanislav Grof, you know, would have said that there's still not a lot, still a lot of science missing from this. Yeah. Um, Wim Hof would would agree that there's not. We don't really know what's going on, and um, I think probably you know, and, and sort of stealing this from James Nestor that when you're doing holotropic breathing, you're putting yourself in such a physical biochemical state that your, your brain thinks you're dying. So uh, you get the impression that you're kind of leaving your body and you know, do anything to get you to breathe normally, mm. um, which is normally digging up that past trauma, letting you have a feel of it once more to get you to, to breathe normally. Okay. Ah, interesting. That's an interesting theory. I know there, there is a study going on at the moment where they're, they're trying to do basically fMRI brain scans on people who are doing breath work. Um, so it's kind of very much mirrors some of the studies that have been done, obviously, with psychedelics to understand what's happening in the brain during sure. some of these experiences. So that will be really interesting to see if there are some similarities there. Yeah, there will be similarities. I think with psychedelics, there's an increase in respiratory rate anyway. Um, so once you increase the respiratory rate, you change the Bohr effect and um, you get um, a lack of, lack of oxygen to the brain. So you reduce oxygen flow to the brain. So that will show up on the tests, obviously. Um, but there's all sorts of other factors as well um, in terms of the vagus nerve and, you know, build up a fluid in your, in your brain. And, um, and certainly to a certain degree in terms of um, the, the vagus nerve and, and your, your C1 and C2 um, um, sort of vertebrae in terms of pressure on the back of the head, how much fluid is sort of traveling around the head and how much blood flow is allowed into the head because of certain tension in muscles in the body and the neck. Um, because if somebody goes into a psychedelic session or a breathwork session with some kind of muscle dysfunction where you're already getting um, restriction, 
then those results will be very different to somebody who's quite equilibrially sort of balanced. Um, and there's so much involved with that, I think, especially after I spoke to Seb, the biological dentist, that if you ch favour chewing on one side of the head, it, it can put tension on one side and not the other. Huh. And then this can affect the, the balance of C1 and C2 and how cerebral fluid is delivered around the brain and how oxygen gets to the brain sometimes as well. So there's just far too much involved. In, in the, yeah. Um, with, with individuals because you know your, your, your DNA and your autonomic nervous system is as unique as your DNA it's only ever witnessed through you um, so again you'd have to test hundreds thousands of people to get anywhere near um, any kind of records that were that were usable because of the complex nature of experience life experience yeah that's really interesting I don't have any idea which side of my door I favour. So the first question was like, wow, how do people even think about this? Um, but yeah, fascinating. It shows that repetitiveness um, and how that can impact things, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, and, and, and sort of what I'm using, using this for, you know, for, 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 for um, I don't know, sort of pleasurable, and using it for sort of, I don't know, some people are using, using these for like social events now. Hey, we get together for a breathe. Yeah, let's let's have a bit, let's have a breathe on Friday. Yeah. Uh, a lot of ex, like I say, a lot of ex-addicts do that because it's, you know, people say to me when they've done the breast surgery, like, man, I have never felt like that without taking drugs. That was incredible. So if that's how it's making people feel, you have to, you, have, you kind of have to be careful a little bit that they're not going to be using that to find safety. Uh, and that's where I suppose regulation then has, is important with it. I think a lot of my work now is, is all based around safety, which is why when I talk with clients now, I take away the human aspect quite a lot mm -hmm. um, and, and go back to the animal, you know, what, what does the animal do? And, you know, just, you know, very, very subtle changes along the way can, can change how you feel in certain environments for the rest of your life. You know, something as simple as having an umbilical cord around your neck when you're born can increase your sympathetic drive enough to change how safe you feel forever. You know, it's just an idea, Alex, but it, it makes a lot of sense that from being in a, a parasympathetic state for nine months, and I know I'm going all over the place with this, but being in that parasympathetic bubble for nine months the, the, the most parasympathetic you'll ever be, the most safest space you'll ever be. You don't have to breathe, you don't have to eat, you don't have to do anything, you just exist all through um, the, you know, the host, your mother. And after nine months of being in that parasympathetic heaven, you're, you're kind of pushed in, into sympathetic drive through a narrow canal and you experience three very unique things when you come out. You breathe through your mouth when your lungs empty, you gasp, you're cold and you're frightened. Fear starts and it never leaves you until you draw your last breath. And that is the basis of anxiety because every human being has it because it's not possible to be alive without it because you'd be dead already. So we need anxiety. It's the only thing that keeps us from, from, from dying. So we all have complex anxiety, every human being. The Dalai Lama will vouch for and uh, the, the sooner we realize that and we start delivering that to people, the better. And every human is just trying to get back to the very safest version of themselves that it remembers in terms of the body keeping the score. It remembers your safest place, which generally is a Saturday night at home with your door locked, with your favorite tipple, eating some pizza, watching a film, happy, smiling, parasympathetic again, ventral vagal in, in polyvagal theory, ventral vagal. Um, and then Sunday night comes along and then you've got work the next day and it starts to creep in again. It's making you feel unsafe because it really wants you to be always at Saturday night, just as an idea. Mm. But realistically, I think it always wants you back in the womb, the body. From the minute you come out, you're on your own and you want to get back. And I don't think it ever stops yearning for that, Alex. That's beautifully put, Kev. Um, and I think certainly resonates with 
with material I've read, people I've spoken to, experiences I've had ultimately in sort of slightly altered states of consciousness. Um, and to put another perspective to it, we, you've spoken about some people sometimes, uh, let's say kind of getting addicted to the, the high of breath work, for example, and how good we can feel afterwards. Um, I also wonder sometimes whether there is an for want of a better word, an addiction to the also that kind of the out of body experience that we can have with certain forms of breath work. And if we don't feel safe in our body, or well, we can either think and find times that we were, or we can just flat out leave the body for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's another way that we can get somewhat addicted to the experiences of things like altered states of consciousness. And I know in transformational breath, they talk about, um, they talk about sort of a, a surge and I forget, I, I forget how they, how um, Judith phrases it, but essentially it's an urge to go back to the source, to go back to the womb. Um, and on four occasions now during breath work, I've just completely and utterly passed out. And you can say that that could be hyperventilation. However, it always happens with toning and movement. So it's always when I'm making noise and I'm moving the body in each of those four times. And so there's the other explanation, which comes from things people like Judith, which is there's a, a part of me that wants to go home ultimately. Um, and I think that really resonates. Um, I don't think it is just hyperventilating because it doesn't happen at the times when I would have thought it would happen within a session, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I really kind of connect with what you're saying there. Yeah, it's beautiful that, mate. Yeah, and I think, you know, just from your own personal experiences there, you know, the whole thing kind of, and it, it resonates really, it resonates with so many people. And obviously I, I, I see doctors and I've had taken in loads of psychotherapists and um, loads of midwives, loads of nurses, people in the med, a kidney doctor, you know, I've taken in people from all walks of life. And when you talk to them about that side of it, they're like, wow, man, that makes a lot of sense, you know, to, we, we make subtle changes in, in, in mankind and we think it doesn't really make any difference, but it does makes a massive difference. And, and like James Ness says about the breastfeeding, does it really make that much of a difference? Yeah, of course it does. Because it's an interference of hundreds of thousands of years worth, 500 million years worth of evolution that we absolutely have not even just, even at the tip of the iceberg of understanding who do we think we are, you know? We're nowhere near, you know, that this human body is, is absolute genetic perfection and we're interfering with it in so many ways that it can't cope you know i say to people all the time should we be driving vehicles at 50 miles an hour humans aren't designed for that you know 20 miles an hour maybe tops if we run some faster usain bolt etc but we're not designed for 50 miles an hour what are we doing to to our autonomic nervous system by traveling at that speed we are we're putting it on an edge of where it shouldn't really be and we've been doing that for a long time now trying to increase and get faster and faster and faster and faster um it, it's changing humans um in the long run you know i think it's changing it's changing the course of human history the fact that we're creating false environments alex and these things are to to blame too because you know i say this to everybody you know teenagers these days anxiety is through the roof but most teenagers are in real environments they're in false ones most of the time you know they see a thing and hey oh it's a cute panda having giving birth oh it's so beautiful it's a lovely light check this out yeah and then the next one they swipe up three seconds after it's a tsunami <laughs> oh my god and they have a little bit of adrenaline rush when they see people getting swept oh my god well, they even do this. This is a, um, an ancient thing of holding your breath so that predators can't hear you. <gasps> you know? Oh, my God. So they feel the, the same adrenaline as the people that are in the tsunami. 
only what we're supposed to do with that adrenaline. They just go and have a pot noodle or go and have some tea or go and watch the telly and it's still there. And that's what's kind of happening to people. This is why they're constantly in autonomic dysfunction. 80% of teenagers with ADHD are mouth breathers in a recent study in America. Snores. So are we changing? We're changing the course of evolution by creating false environments and we end up becoming our thoughts, which is what Sadhguru talks about. Sorry, mate, all over the place. <laughs> no, it's brilliant. I think the conversations that are all over the place are always the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, but it's true, you know, I, I, I always remember a conversation I had with my sister probably a couple of years ago now, um, and she was talking about how she has a friend, the friend has a son, and the son went in for a dentist appointment, you know, maybe 20 minutes long or something like that. He came out and he had something like 200 WhatsApp messages from his friends um, within that sort of 20 minute period. And, you know, it's kind of like, where are you? Why aren't you responding? What are you doing? Have I offended you? What's wrong? Oh. And he was just like, how do you parent in this world? Like, we don't even have our own experiences of growing up with the technology that the the younger kids now have so it's not like we even have our own personal experiences of how we navigated it so we're kind of parenting in this completely new paradigm um and i think most people are quite terrified about how that's going to go i know i sort of think about oscar and what it will be like 10 in 10 years when you know he's going to definitely be asking for these sorts of things if not before um yeah. So yeah, it is kind of tricky. And that kind of constant stimulus, I think, has such an impact on our nervous system and our well-being. Um, and how many of us just know firsthand that if we can detach from technology even a little bit, how much better we feel, how much more time and space there suddenly is in our lives. Um, and it's it's something that I think we can all focus on a lot more. Yeah, for, for, for sure. Yeah. And this, uh, th th there isn't a session that goes by that is, this isn't mentioned, that there isn't one. Every session that's mentioned is, is the worry about kids and anxiety is something I hear every single solitary day. There isn't a day that goes by where people aren't in some kind of dysfunction because of the catastrophizing mind. And because that is directly connected to the respiratory system we know it is in terms of your amygdala driven fear where ca carbon dioxide is playing a part in that a role in that um so you know when we when we're working with people to depending on what you know it's all right having, having a space with somebody and saying we need to do this we need to do that again this is this kind of highlights why you know um medicine doesn't always really work because what they're doing is that they're kind of addressing the issue with something that's going to try and make you think or feel a bit different as opposed to getting you to stop doing the thing that's making you feel that way in the first place which a lot of the time is um is is, is being present as opposed to being in environments that don't exist um, and and your respiratory rate that's, that's connected to that you know, that high 90%, you know, if not all of them, anybody that comes to me with anxiety, they're over breathing or they have a sensitivity to carbon dioxide, a chemoreceptor sensitivity to CO2. They have low bolt scores um, and control pauses. So instinct, the, the body is reactive, overreactive to CO2. I do things like breathing through straws with people now, um, just drinking straws like these. Um, and I just say, I just want you to breathe through this straw for one minute. So they pinch their nose. In, out. And then I just say, go with how you feel. Some people, they can't breathe through this for any more than about five seconds before they go. Oh. So, so, so what's, what's happening there with people? You know, they're very sensitive <clears throat> to the buildup of CO2 in the body. So that's causing um, hyperventilation then because by the time they have a breath in and by the time they exhale they're quickly taking the next breath in again so they're hyperventilating they're breathing up and down into dead space all the time so they're not getting oxygen and you know this is making people poorly 
you know, high cortisol levels. And they're, they're running on adrenaline constantly. They can't sleep. And it's making them, it's making them really ill. And the, you know, the, the diaphragm is, you know, it's not just a, um, a tool that's for breathing. It's connected to so much more in the body. The diaphragm is really something that's taken for granted. Um, you know, it's far more important than really in terms of it as the pump that it is probably more important than the heart really in terms of its function in the body. Some pulmonotes would say as a siphon, as a pump, it's doing far more than just breathing. It's removing toxins from your body. It's keeping your intestines moving. It's holding up your pelvic floor in women. It's, it's everything. Yeah. So. And you mentioned the bolt score there, Kev. For our listeners that aren't aware of that, do you, are you happy just to kind of quickly expand on what that is? <clears throat> yeah, the bolt score, uh, I think it was originally uh, when Constantine Buteyko, uh, I think he, he referred to it as a control pause, or, or in Buteyko instructors, we refer to it as a Buteyko, but in Oxygen Advantage, they use the bolt score, um, which means the word bolt is body oxygen level test. Um, so basically, this is getting people to just breathe in and out normally at their own rate, not slow or long breaths, just breathe as you would normally breathe at home. And then as soon as you're comfortable on your next outward breath, you pinch your nose and just pause breathing. That's why it's called a controlled pause. It's not really holding your breath because there's nothing in there. Your lungs are empty. You hold your nose, you set your timer on your phone and you're closing your eyes and focusing in on the sensations in the body to see where your chemoreceptors drive you to breathe. So that's the first sign, physiological, biochemical sign from your body and biomechanical sign from your body that you need to take a breath. Either your diaphragm will drop, you'll feel a bit of a twinge in your costal muscles of your ribs, you'll feel the neck muscles sort of tighten up, something in your throat, sometimes a bit of a swallow, saliva build up, you know, you'll, you'll feel something in the body that says, I need to take a breath. That's when you stop the timer. That is your biochemical urge to breathe. That's the, whatever you feel is a response of your central chemoreceptors, which are blood monitors for, for those that don't know what chemoreceptors are. So they're monitoring your CO2 and oxygen levels in the body constantly. So you've got central chemoreceptors and peripheral ones all over the body. Um, and as soon as they, they, they detect higher, higher levels of CO2, depending on how sensitive they are, that's where it gets complicated. As soon as they detect higher levels of CO2, those chemoreceptors send a message to the locus coralis in the brain, sends a message to your diaphragm to drop, diaphragm drops, pressure changes in your chest cavity, you take on outside pressure, which is one breath. Dead easy, 30,000 times a day. <laughs> yeah. And then they're, they're kind of, I can't quite remember the top of my head, but is it sort of 20 seconds is sort of the minimum that we want to be seeing for that, that, um, that pause after the exhale? And you're back. Yeah, sorry, mate, I lost you for a second there. I heard you say 20 seconds. Yeah, so there's sort of... A, the bolt test is really giving us an indication of someone's um, sensitivity to carbon dioxide and their sort of capacity to, or the, the quality of the breath, shall we say. So what is the minimum amount of time that we should be able to pause after that exhale before we have that sign that we need to breathe? The general consensus is anything from 0 to 15 seconds would indicate that you've got asthma or you've got a you know, high percentage that you're you potentially could be chronically hyperventilating or there's dysfunctional breathing. And I think between 15 and 25 seconds, there's improvement there, obviously. But the, the benchmark really is 40 seconds. Um, I don't know many people that can get to that. I'm still not at 40 seconds uh, on an exhale. However, I can hold my breath on an inhale for about three and a half minutes now. Um, bearing in mind, I've had asthma all my life as well uh, for 40 years. So, uh, and when I got COVID last time, it kind of undoes some of the work that you've done. Mm. So you go back again and start holding your breath again. Um, but yeah, generally, you know, 40 seconds is good. But I think anybody that's over 25 seconds, up to 30 seconds, they're generally pretty good. Um, you know, they're not getting a response to breathe for that long. But you'd be surprised how many people are under 10 seconds. Yeah. Before an urge to breathe, all the ones with anxiety, mo most of them, I would say. 
um, they're, they're below 10 seconds. Yeah, I don't think I've seen many people below, oh, sorry, above 10 either. Um, I don't think I was at the beginning when I first did the bolt test. Um, mm. And I think that the challenge is to not allow your will to, to, to lie. <laughs> you know, I, I always really try and encourage people, as you say, to, to really tune into the body for that first sign that you need to breathe. Absolutely, that's really important. And if you're breathing lightly, you really shouldn't be able to hear yourself breathing. You should be breathing so lightly, like you're sat watching telly or whatever, you're nice and relaxed. And then when you breathe out, you pinch your nose and hold, you, you listen in for that first reaction from the body. When you let go, you take your recovery breath in, which should be through the nose, not the mouth. Instinctively, people recover through the mouth too much. You should recover through the nose, but when you let go, it should be as gentle as it was almost when you when you uh, paused your breath. If you're letting go and you're doing this, it's because you've held too long, <clears throat> because that's not natural. So you've probably just gone on a few seconds too long. Remove a few seconds off it, that's probably generally where you would be. Mm -hmm. You've just held a little bit long. Ego sort of holding really, or not quite sure what the feeling is. Some people are very detached from the body, so they don't know. Well, yeah, it's just that feeling you have when you want to breathe, isn't it? people say and I say yeah can you feel your diaphragm drop and it's, it's difficult when you're doing this sometimes to put things into terms you say what's what's a diaphragm drop so when you're working with individuals it's so important that they understand knowledge is power when it comes to good breathing good biomechanics mm. so yeah when you're recovering it should be nice and gentle that would be an efficient bolt score do one in the morning one in the evening the ones in the evening are generally a bit better Okay, brilliant. So that gives people, I guess, a, a nice, simple exercise they can do that gives them a basic overview, I guess, and an evaluation of the breath. A question that comes to mind after that is, you know, Kev, do you have any, do you have a breath practice per se? So are there things that you try and do on a, a regular basis as a way to improve any of these sorts of parameters? Um, I, I use... Um... I use an app on my phone that is, is, is apnea. Uh, it's called Stamina Apnea Trainer. Uh, and that is O2 and oxygen tables. So that's the breath holding and then breathing and the breath holding. And each breath, each time you have to recover on your breath is less. So you're building up CO2 in small increments. Uh, and and that, I find that very helpful in terms of when I exercise, because obviously when I exercise, I breathe through my nose my mouth is taped shut when I run um to make sure that you know that I'm, I'm breathing correctly and you only have to look at people like you know these Ethiopian runners and stuff when they're running these marathons their mouths are closed they're not running with their mouths open um because your body can regulate you know far more efficiently when you're breathing through your nose during exercise all right there will come times where you'll need, you're going up a hill or whatever, sometimes you may need to open your mouth, get a bit more air in, get a bit more oxygen, increase it slightly um, because of the load that's required. But generally, the more you can breathe through your nose during exercise, the better. And by holding your breath and improving your chemoreceptor sensitivity to carbon dioxide by holding your breath each day, you're improving that chemistry set. You're improving your sensitivity to CO2, but is that affecting anxiety? Is that improving how you react in certain situations? Well, in terms of how I think the amygdala is connected to sympathetic chain and CO2, I, I think definitely it is. Because if you react less to CO2, are you going to react less in dangerous situations? Probably, yeah. So, does it reduce the tummy turns when you go into supermarkets and things? Yes, it does. Because I have feedback from people that say, look, it's less. I feel more confident in the staff room now. I don't feel the same. And that's somebody that's gone from a bolt score of four seconds to 20. All right, it's took her six months, but she's got there. And she says that she feels more confident and she doesn't feel frightened as much. So... The connection between CO2 and, and, and anxiety or, or panic disorder is, is massive. Mm, amazing. Um, 
you know, talking about how the breath and improving these receptors can improve our mental or emotional well-being, you already picked up on obviously the importance of the diaphragm. And I think I'm right in saying that nasal breathing kind of uh, activates the diaphragm a little bit more effectively than mouth breathing. And the diaphragm, as you mentioned, is important from a lymphatic system perspective. So it's supporting the detoxification of various things, but also it's kind of, it is a mechanical pump for all of those abdominal organs. So it's providing a massage to the intestines and people can find that therefore it will be beneficial for IBS type gut stuff potentially as well. Um, so there, I mean, and we could go on and on ultimately about some of the other connections and benefits of breathing to most of the different bodily systems. It's, it really is fascinating. It, it is, mate. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of people that come to me with anxiety and panic disorder, they, they strangely, they, they suffer with irritable bowel syndrome, acid reflux, uh, irregular toilet habits. Some people don't use the toilet for two days. And I hear that a lot. It's like, that's not normal. You know, and in, in hospitals, um, and when they go to doctors, you know, that they'll, some of the um, things they tell patients to do is to jump up and down on the spot or jump, on, jump up and down on a trampet, trampoline. So what's that doing? Is that mimicking the diaphragm, maybe? Why not? So if your diaphragm isn't really getting a lot of use and it's not getting a lot of movement, if it's not dropping this three quarters of an inch that it needs to drop each time, if it's only dropping a little bit less than that, constantly, 24 hours a day, it's only moving slightly, as opposed to moving the full amount, is that affecting this, like you said, this massage of the intestine? 100% it is, because it's, like I say, hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary perfection. So how do we get food? If the food is too still, regardless of whether you're eating meat or whatever, you know, if you're eating meat, it's harder to digest. So the body's had to adapt when we started to eat meat to, 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 to move the gut and to move the intestine around. Otherwise it just lies there and then people start to get ill and they die. So the, the adaptation, the evolution of mankind has allowed the diaphragm to start to create this, this model, you know? So by changing that, is that affecting everything else? It is, it, it all has a knock-on effect. And, you know, biochemically in the body then, in terms of how the body finds homeostasis, um, CO2 plays a big role in that as well because of the, the buffering capacity of your kidneys. Mm. So, you know, your body's always under duress all the time if you're hyperventilating. Um, and it doesn't really look as bad as you think hyperventilation. A lot of people think, well, I don't go around panting. But it's just slightly shallow breaths. It's just in and out and in and out and in and out. Whereas it should be about five seconds, five and a half seconds, they think, is, is an optimum breath, which is about sort of I think about six, eight, ten breaths per minute, really. If you go into cardiac, acute cardiac wards, people have had heart attacks, etc., the respiratory rates look 25 breaths per minute, 29 breaths per minute sometimes. You know, that is so unhealthy. You know, no wonder there's so much um, artery constriction and, and blood vessel constriction in the body with the lack of CO2 that much mm. and nitric oxide. Right. Yeah. I think the, there's a term that came to mind when you were, when you were talking in, in transformational breath, they talk about um, when the breath gets activated. Um, and they're referring to that point when, as a facilitator, you're kind of watching the breather and it's almost like they are being breathed. Like there gets to this point where there's this beautiful, open, expansive breath. Um, and that's where a lot of that kind of integration, I think, and processing can take place. Um, but, you know, making sure and in or encouraging someone to make full use of that respiratory system is such a powerful tool. And, you know, you shared some incredible insight in regards to the type of benefits people are experiencing by coming to see you and by being more aware of the breath and being given exercises and ways to improve the sensitivity of some of these receptors. Um, 
which in some ways is a nice segue. I'm mindful of, of time, Kev, but oh, yeah. we, uh, we just briefly touch on um, psychedelics, which I know is something that we're both kind of oh. passionate about. Um, and I think the two are so complementary, ultimately. You know, if you go on a psychedelic retreat in places like the Netherlands or Portugal, you often find that breath work is one of those key complementary practices, often the morning of the psychedelic ceremony, because there is such similarity, sort of energetically, physically, emotionally, sometimes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I know we've, we've touched a lot on this in the past, um, you know, psychedelics. Um, I've had my moments with, with psychedelics as well. And, you know, um, I think certainly looking at, you know, recent documentaries and reading certain material, that there's definitely a way to use this amazing plant matter um, safely um, to, to, to get to help people to process, not really recovery. Um, you know, I'm always a bit careful about recovery because there is no recovery, really, I don't think, because it always, if it was recovery or you were repairing something, um, you know, it'd be easy if that was the case. If you could recover and repair it, it, you'd almost be undoing evolution. It's always going to be there. Whatever it is that's caused you so many problems over the years, whether it's depression or anxiety or PTSD or trauma, et cetera, et cetera, for any reason why you might want to get involved with psychedelics or breath work or both, you, you, it's almost really about just resetting neural pathways using... The, the natural things that we have, the, the most natural thing we have obviously is the breath, but why not use these chemicals that help to increase your respiratory rate, which we mentioned before anyway, when you're using psychedelics, there's a lot of increased respiratory rate and it will increase the effect, the harder you breathe on psychedelics, which is what Stanislav Grof found out, didn't he, in late 60s, early 70s, I don't know the full history on that, but he discovered on, on one of his patients that when they increased the breath, they, the, the effects of the um, like surgic acid as they were using then started to creep up again they started to get the effects of it again because they started to hyperventilate the body so again changing the chemistry set and that's basically all it is but this does give the ability for people to reset neural pathways safely um, with a medicine that you can't overdose on yet yeah, these things that we were handed to people these SSRIs and, and Ritalin and things like that they're, they're horrible things that they really are that they just you know they just dull people's minds and, and they, they change chemicals in the body in the wrong way um and i think they're probably a bit nervous about psychedelics the powers that be alex <laughs> yeah i i do just find it fascinating that there are these natural plant substances that have been around for pretty much as long as we have that that can give us these sorts of experiences that also facilitate various insights that can help us process trauma and many other things. Um, and it's crazy to me that they are illegal. I mean, even in the Netherlands, it's the truffle that's legal. So as soon as that mushroom starts to fruit, um, it becomes illegal. And when you sort of step back and think that this sort of natural fungi that is all over the world can be outlawed like that um you know i think because we've grown up at a time where it was just a class one drug and that's that you don't really sit and contemplate just how in some ways barbaric it is that people are being prevented from having access to something that has been shown so clearly to be helpful for so many yeah beautifully put mate and that's that's it in a nutshell you know this um these, these chemicals, you know, psilocybin uh, and, and others, you know, they're, they've got so much potential, really, for, for mental health and physical health in, in human beings um, and potentially in animals too, you know. There's, I've read a little bit about that too and, you know, um, the limits are endless and everything in nature is there for us to use and utilise Um and things and, and drugs and, and things that are made in, 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 in labs and in pharmaceutical industries, they're, 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 not, they're, not, they're not natural. So they're gonna, they're gonna be different in the body, 
you know, um, putting something in your body that's natural, that's grown in the ground, especially something that, you know, is far more intelligent than, than we are. You know, you only have to watch these documentaries to work out how intelligent mycelium is and, and the earth and all this stuff that was around millions of years, millions and millions of years, hundreds of millions of years before we were. And we just turn up and all of a sudden decide that oh, no, we can't use that now because of the money that's connected to it potentially or the threat uh, of that that's connected to it. And, and even, you know, going just a little bit, going back to the breath, if everybody became good breathers overnight tonight, it would cripple the pharmaceutical industry. It would absolutely put it on its backside within weeks. It would be struggling because if everybody's respiratory health was was on point and I know because I've had asthma for 40 years I've cancelled my prescription for an inhaler I don't need one and I've had it for 40 years and somebody told me about Buteco 40 years ago I wouldn't have taken an inhaler if, if you do the maths you know how many hundreds of thousands of pounds is that in inhalers and tablets just for me you know it would cripple the industry and you know in SSRIs now they're keeping people rich uh, when we could be using some of these amazing natural substances, um, you know, like mushrooms, to, to to help people reset these neural pathways and and get over some of their past by by helping them just to reprocess a lot of situations that the autonomic nervous system has cleverly pushed away back into the body almost and and not really allowed um, memory. Some, in some cases, a lot of the time they get people get flashes and they get memories of these things that can't let them go. Most of the time, they just feel this feeling rather than actually having the memory. And that is the emotion that you potentially were feeling at the time that it happened. Bearing in mind, you could be 50 and you could have been abused when you were five. So you're, you're feeling the emotion of a five-year-old every day of your life until you're 50. And then you can take some mushrooms that will allow you to process that from a 50 year old mind now, which will change how you feel forever. No brainer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's exciting times. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think, and what I like is that we're at a time whereby no matter what your kind of inclination and preferences, there are different ways that we can now talk about the role that psychedelics or plant medicines um can play within the healing process so you know for those that are more scientifically inclined we've now got the science and we understand some of the mechanisms by which these plants help us and for some i think that's their entrance into oh actually you know what i'm i'm sort of rest assured that there's this kind of scientific data there i'm now open to to trying it where others might be less inclined to follow the science but hear all of these cases and stories and documentaries of people that have healed themselves from numerous different types of conditions and diagnoses. So I think we're, we're reaching this point where there's different roads into psychedelic use, which is which I think excites me as well. It excites me. It might not change in our lifetime. I hope it does. Um, but certainly with things like ayahuasca as well, um, you know, there's, there's more science, there's more money needs to be pumped into testing what these chemicals are doing in the brain and in, and in the body uh, in humans and, and using it, you know, properly. Um, and, you know, I know that, you know, you, you have a specific interest in it, you know, it's part of what you do. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with sort of watching documentaries about it and reading about it and about it's mentioned in the Bible and mushrooms are mentioned in the Bible. I'm sure they are. So I was listening to somebody talk about that and, um, so, so who knows, who knows where it's going to go from here, but it's exciting because people are just being a little bit more open-minded, like you said about the science now. It's, you can quite easily use all the science and then all of a sudden, you know, it's not a recreational drug in the 60s, Woodstock, you know, and everybody thinks, oh yeah, magic mushrooms, go and get in, you know, wrecked in a park when you're a teenager. It has that side to it, obviously, because that's the history of it. But the other side of it is, is that, you know, people are using the science of it now in labs and, um, and they're, they're, they're using it on human beings in, in trials now. And they're very, very, very effective by all accounts. Mm. And it's a real kind of, I think it's a great example of the paradox of all of this, because, 
you know, one of the things that I sometimes, I guess, struggle with is you've got kind of the science and a modern approach to psychedelics on one hand. And then you've got, as you were mentioning earlier, you know, thousands upon thousands of years of just ancient wisdom through indigenous tribes. And, and they've, they've learned this through generations of experience, as it were. Sure. Um, and trying to balance the two and trying to get the best of both, I think is, can be quite challenging, but I think is really needed and really important. And um, an exercise that I had to do on the practitioner training was just kind of exploring some of the the similarities and some of the things that aren't so similar around those two different practices. So, you know, from an indigenous perspective, often psychedelic ceremony takes place at night, for example, whereas mm -hmm. in, in the studies um, and most of the uh, sort of experiences in the Western world are often during the day. Um, okay. Apparently, uh, previously it was the shaman that would take the ayahuasca, the participants wouldn't actually take any. Um, but that's completely changed based on, like, I guess, a bit of need and demands. Yeah. Um, but isn't that interesting how it would be the healer taking the ayahuasca as a way to sort of facilitate? And then I think I'm right in saying they would sort of sing their songs um, and work energetically with the person that was seeking healing. Um, right. which really spins things on its head um, as well. That's absolutely, I, I never knew that. And yeah, I yeah. Think it's, literally, I think it's investing in, 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 in mankind's history. And I know I went, I went to a, a cacao ceremony last night um, with these um, indigenous people from Peru and um, his wife was interpreting because he didn't speak any English. But man, I mean, it was just such a, a beautiful ceremony they were talking about the medicine and and how they use it and how they dry it and how they crush it and how they they manipulate it to get all the goodness out of it and 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 you know proper ceremonial grade cacao is made from these seeds from the cacao plant it's dried out it's crushed and ground up mixed with water and the whole ceremony is just a beautiful thing you know yeah. That, that, that you know that, that they still use to this day and they don't get poorly in peru they don't they don't get cancer they don't get high blood pressure they don't get uh high yeah, they don't have um anxiety and depression you know so, so so what is it that they're doing you know what is it they're doing that we're, do, we're doing wrong you know and we need to just key into these ancient traditions uh, all right, yeah, some of them are chemical, but we have to stop being so afraid of something like that. You know what I mean? It's, um, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know? And I think even when I speak to people that have lost people, everybody's lost somebody to cancer. Yet most cancers don't survive very well in oxygen-rich environments. So why don't they tell people to breathe in such a way that they're getting more oxygen, which is through the nose? You know, I've taken, I think, four GPs into the cold now and I've asked them all, which is the best way to breathe. And a few of them said any, either the mouth or the nose. So, you know, and these are the people that we rely upon in white coats to look after our children, to look after Oscar and little Austin, who's on the way for me. You know, we go to the doctors, what's wrong with them? You know, are we, are we best taking them to doctors? You know, are we... Are we Best doing our homework ourselves first. I know a lot of people that are doing that, Alex. They're, they're, they're asking questions, they're investigating themselves first because they're finding that on a lot of occasions that the NHS is letting them down, unfortunately. Mm. And that's nothing to say, you know, our NHS system is amazing, our national health system. And I work with so many people who are loyal to it and who work amazingly through it. It just seems a little bit far behind. It just seems a bit lost the medical profession at the moment, we're fixing broken things as opposed to sort of being proactive in terms of keeping, staying healthy. Um, so yeah, we, we, we're struggling in the West at the moment. Yeah, it's so true. We need that paradigm shift. Um, I was speaking to a friend earlier about this concept of P4 medicine and one of the four P being preventative. Yeah. Um, but prevent preventation or preventative medicine 
kind of requires education. It requires helping people understand what they need to be doing to prevent these conditions in the first place. And how much easier is life in every way, arguably, when we are in a state of health and coherence and the longer we have some form of dis-ease, how much harder is it to return to a state of health? Because it's like, the way I think about it is it's almost like that, that imbalance, that pathophysiology has just got more and more embedded in the system. Um, it's just got more hardwired. So we really need to be acting as quickly as possible on any symptoms that we pick up, but we also need to be really focusing on the preventation because then it's so much easier to shift things when we do need to. Um, I think it's such an important message for the younger generations. Yeah, for, for definite. I'm so I'm so frightened for the younger generations. I'm doing my best to try and get back into schools again after the summer holidays to try and talk to them about their breathing. If even if they just take a little bit away from some of the um, some of the lessons and you know some of the workshops, mm. uh, you know you don't always have to react. To, to certain things that your body's doing it's just telling you that it's just not happy about something and you know you're not having a panic attack you know just breathe through your nose or breathe through a straw or you know just a cover yeah. and then, then just try and find out what the trigger is you know it's okay you know your body will do these little things every now and again you know the people are having panic attacks all the time and that a lot of the time it's because they don't understand what their body's doing and you think when you're in this day and age that you teach people how to breathe before teaching them, you know, about geography or algebra, you know, <laughs> nothing, sorry to all the maths teachers and geography teachers that are listening to this and how dare you, but, you know, people need, need to know how their bodies work first. Anatomy and physiology should be drilled into our, our uh, people, our, our children. Uh, they should know how the body works. They should know what adrenaline does. They should know what epinephrine is. They should know what cortisol does in the body. They should know that what happens to their blood when they're over breathing. They should know that they should be breathing through their nose and not their mouth. You know, in, in indigenous tribes in, in the world, there is there's one indigenous tribe who are coming of age for young men. They make them drink from a cup and they make them run across the desert or the, or the plains and they have to spit the water out in a cup at the end and they cannot spill a drop because they're making them breathe through their nose because they know that if they breathe through their mouth in the desert, they're going to die. Right. It'll dry your airway out and it'll dry your body and you'll sweat and your body can't regulate its temperature. When your mouth is closed, you're breathing through your first line of defense against all that, your nose. So just by learning about things that we've forgot and teaching our kids the things that we've forgot as adults, we'll all be healthier, yeah. you know? The first thing you do when you come out is you breathe. The second thing you do is you eat. You latch onto your breast of your mother or a bottle. You know, concentrate on those two things alone and we're all healthier. Yeah, I mean, that's reminded me of a little story. You know, you've, you've mentioned around removing the human part of us and thinking of the animal part, uh, for want of a better word, of, of how you said it. And, that's so true. I mean, I got told a, a very quick story recently of, um, I can't quite remember the tribe, but it's one of the African tribes. And um, a mentor of mine was, or a mentor's friend of mine was, was visiting them, living with them. And they went out for a hunt in the desert and they were running around because that's what they did. Um, and they got sort of close towards the end of the day. And to cut a long story short, there was nothing in sight. They were literally in the middle of the desert. There was no geographical land point or anything that would tell you where home is. And, and this guy was like, how, how are we gonna get home? Like, there's no way of knowing which direction home is in anymore. Um, and apparently they kind of all just looked around and just started moving off in a direction. Um, and they were just, they, it was an intuitive awareness that this is the way home. And if you think around, you know, all the documentaries that many of us have watched about wildlife and these huge um, sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Migrations that they do, which yeah. is kind of based on things like electromagnetic frequencies and things. And you kind of think we have just become so detached from our previous existence and being connected with that land and our bodies and that intuition. And mm -hmm. I thought it was just fascinating that that's how they were able to navigate the desert. 
um, because we are fundamentally the same as that. We've just got disconnected from, I think, that body intelligence. Yeah, that's fascinating that you say that. Yeah, and you know, I, I read that in the book *Sapiens*. Um, how how humans, once we discovered how to grow food and store food, that we no longer had to forage. So if we no longer had to forage. We didn't have to have that sense of direction. We didn't have to have that autonomic sense of where we were on the planet. You know, so we removed from mankind something that was in us, something that was innate in human beings uh, we've sort of if from an evolutionary perspective we've altered by being so clever and unfortunately goes against the grain a little bit for me because the more oxygen that we got to the brain by being better diaphragmatic breathers which we were as like neanderthals etc we start to become very very efficient breathers big nostrils and stuff big jaws that's in breath by james nestor that we've ad adapted as human beings as we have but We've we've over adapted now to the part, to the point where we we're becoming senseless, and we don't and we're we're losing these these tools that we had. And I speak to people all the time about the autonomic nervous system. It's working every tenth of a second to try and find safety for you, and it's doing it all the time. And you know sometimes you get that sense that somebody stood behind you, even though you can't see them, you can't smell anything in the room, but you sense. There's somebody behind you and you could you look around and there's somebody there how do you know that that's something that's that's inside the body that's something that's genetically there that's been there for a very 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 long time and you know who are we to to, to think that we know anything about how that's worked in the past for us as mammals you know we're, we're miles behind <laughs> uh, and we've, we've forgotten and lost it all but, you know, these indigenous tribes and that, they haven't, you know, they haven't lost it. They still part, they, they know exactly, and animals know, um, you know. And, but I think we still have a lot of senses there. People say, oh, I, I have this affinity to water. I'm a real water baby. I said, you have an affinity to water because you need to drink, you're a mammal. So you want to be near water, <laughs> generally. It's, that's definitely in your body. I always feel a sense of calm when I'm at water. So that's funny, that. You're 70% water. So you will feel a bit calmer when you're near it because you need to drink. So that's what that feeling is. I'm sorry to burst your spiritual bubble. <laughs> but, <laughs> or that you're a Pisces or you're an Aquarius, Aquarius or whatever. But, you know, as animals, take away the human aspect, the emotions, the feelings. He did this, she did that, you know. Eckhart Tolle, you know, just, just quickly, Eckhart Tolle wrote about it in his book, The Power of Now Animals. They, 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 they head to head. You think he referred to it as ducks. There's a male and a female duck in the, in the lake, in the pond, and the other male comes over, tries to get in on the female. The other male comes in, they fight one another, pecking hell out of one another. What, the male wins, the other male swims off. They both go off in separate directions and they both shake and flap all their feathers about. They get rid of all that angst and then they just carry on eating. They don't go around saying, oh, I'm keeping my eye out for you now in the future. Oh, there's him again. There's that guy, that duck who did this to me. I'm going to make sure that I follow him off. I'm going to make sure that tomorrow he's not, he's forgot all about him. And it's the same with lions on the, on the Serengeti. They fight and then one of them, the victor, and the other one just walks off. Forget all about it. They just crack on. Mm. With life, humans, we, we store and hold everything because of this evolvement. We're, we're, we're holding it all. And, you know, that is the human being. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, sh just shaking, talking about what the ducks do, for example. But if I encourage everyone just to, at the end of this podcast, if they're at home, somewhere safe where they can do it, you know, just go and shake your body. Start with the hands, start, then go up to the shoulders, get the torso involved, the hips, the legs, the ankles. And it is incredible how good you can feel after even like two or three minutes of shaking, it's hilarious. <laughs> it is. People are paying to go and do laughter therapy, movement therapy. You know, kids do that. They stamp their feet on the go, ah! yeah. slamming their hands down, and then when they feel better afterwards. So it's, it's no different. So at the end of this, shake your body about, <laughs> make noise, do, do anything, shout, you know, don't frighten your neighbours. 
but then just and then just relax, almost go into sort of shavasana and feel all the buzzes, the tingles, feel the blood running through your veins, feel the movement of your body as you breathe in and out. You'll be so connected to specific movement in the body. The good way of getting connected to your body is by shaking it, moving it. It's 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 brilliant. I love it. Yeah, I did a I, did, I had a shaking session um, on a <laughs> on a recent on a recent retreat um, as a way to kind of get grounded. It we were going into like a sharing circle, and there's there was always something like a meditation or a body movement practice, tai chi or something. And this morning it was shaking, and wow. I, it will stay with me for a very long time. It was probably three minutes of shaking, but afterwards I was like. I feel so much better. <laughs> um, so it is, it's basic things sometimes can be so powerful. Um, so yes, I love what you say there, Kev. Um, but I really am mindful of your time now. Um, and we've covered quite a lot. I think um, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with our listeners. Um, so Kev, thank you so much for coming on. It's been amazing to have a, a proper connection with you rather than a two minute WhatsApp message. <laughs> Yeah, it's lovely to see your face as well. It's nice. To, I love this. This technology is amazing. Unfortunately, it's making us talk a lot more, which is so problematic with mouth breathing. You know, people at <laughs> call centres are talking like flies with anxiety and stuff, and nurses, people who are talking all day, they're, they're struggling. Um, but there are ways around it. You can combat it by doing certain things, breathing in certain ways, so it doesn't. you don't always have to feel anxious. But thank you so much, mate, for having me on and... Um, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, I can't wait to meet you in person. I know we're going to try and see if we can arrange that pretty yeah. soon, hopefully. Brilliant. Very soon, Kev, very soon. I think, I hope so, mate. I hope so. <laughs>